the words that are spoken, Lord, are mine. May the words that are heard be thine. Mark's gospel is the oldest of the four gospels in the Bible. Scholars are clear that originally it ended with the eight verses we just heard. The story ended with the angel announcing that Jesus had been raised from the dead and the women fleeing in terror and amazement. One early addition to the gospel includes a report that the women had told Peter and the other disciples and that they had spread the sacred and imperishable proclamation of eternal salvation. A longer edition mentions Jesus appearing to Mary Magdalene as well as to two men when they were out walking in the country, but that the rest of the disciples did not believe them. The story then continues that later Jesus appeared to the 11 themselves as they were sitting at table and he upbraided them for their lack of faith and stubbornness because they had not believed those who saw him after he had risen. Then Jesus commissioned them to go into all the world and proclaim the good news to the whole creation. This version concludes with Jesus ascending into heaven and the disciples spreading the good news everywhere. While these alternate endings certainly make Mark's gospel align better with the other three gospels that include resurrection appearances and commissioning of the disciples, I find myself wondering why Mark originally ended his gospel as he did. Why did he conclude with the angel telling the three women, do not be alarmed. You are looking for Jesus of Nazareth who was crucified. He has been raised. He is not here. But go, tell his disciples and Peter that he is going ahead of you to Galilee. There you will see him just as he told you. So they went out and fled the tomb, for terror and amazement had seized them. And they said nothing to anyone because they were afraid. My take is that Mark ends his gospel as he does because the story at that point is unfinished. It's incomplete. The women, Peter, the rest of the disciples, and all of us, we, we are the ones who must finish the story with and for Jesus. But what does it mean for us to write the rest of the story with our lives? Undeniably, the prophet Isaiah promises us that the Lord of hosts will make for all peoples a feast of rich food, a feast of well-aged wines. He will swallow up death forever. Then the Lord will wipe away the tears from all faces and the disgrace of the people God will take away. And the angel assures us, Jesus has been raised. He is not here. Death is not victorious. Abundant life is ours. Yet for the people of Israel, for the women at the tomb, and for us here and now, the notion that we are the ones who must complete the story of redemption as we live our lives seems an impossible task. The world is too broken. The empire is too strong. And we are too fearful, uncertain, and ordinary to transform the world. While the angel offers extraordinary words of comfort, hope, and possibility, 
The women are so trapped in their own grief and fear that they flee, unable to share the good news. As I reflected on the response of the women, it occurred to me that just as Jesus descended to the dead, so the women were held captive by death. They came to the tomb early in the morning to anoint Jesus' dead body with spices. They worried that they would not be able to move the stone which closed the tomb. Despite all that Jesus had said to them, they were not prepared to receive the good news of the resurrection. Jesus descended to the dead. But death could not hold him. He was victorious over death. He rose from the dead. The women, on the other hand, seem to have been caught by death. At the turn of the 20th century, priest and poet Rainer Maria Rilke wrote, a lament for urban life in which few seemed capable of practicing resurrection. For Rilke, exploitation of workers and devaluing of human life relegated many living in his city to life among the dead. Lord, the great cities are lost and rotting, Their time is running out. The people there live harsh and heavy, crowded together, weary of their own routine. Beyond them waits and breathes your earth, but where they are, it cannot reach them. Their children waste their days on doorsteps, always in the same shadow. They don't know that somewhere, Wind is blowing through a field of flowers. The young girls have only strangers to parade before, and no one sees them truly. So chilled, they close. And in back rooms, they live out the nagging years of disappointed motherhood. Their dying is long and hard to finish. Hard to surrender what you never received. Their exit has no grace or mystery. It's a little death, hanging dry and measly, like a fruit inside them that has never ripened. After a year of pandemic life, with losses large and small, burdening our souls. And as we celebrate our second Easter on Zoom and Facebook Live, we know a fair amount about the reality of getting stuck in death and despair. Like the women, We sometimes struggle to proclaim the resurrection as the dark and desperate stillness of Holy Saturday holds us. As the women wanted to forget the last three days and return to life as it was before the horrors of betrayal, abandonment, and death, so we want to forget the last year and get back to normal. For many of us, the strands of sorrow and suffering, the burdens of disappointment and loss hold us in captivity and silence our alleluias. As we gather this Easter, death is all around us. We mourn the 554,000 people in the United States and more than 2.8 million globally who have died of the coronavirus. We weep 
with the families and friends of the dozens of people from Atlanta to Orange County who have died in mass shootings during the last three weeks. On Wednesday evening in our Tenebrae worship, members of St. Luke's offered their stories of the shadows of their lives. Those gathered on Zoom prayerfully held painful and powerfully resilient testimonies of disease and death, of families turning against one another, of trans women being victims of social, economic, physical, and emotional violence, of undocumented people being forced to live with shame and fear of students struggling to keep up with school when coping with homelessness, bereavement, food scarcity, and depression. The brokenness of our world casts long shadows in which we must find our way, out of which we must make ourselves visible. Today marks the 53rd anniversary of the assassination of the Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King, Jr. While Dr. King is one who practiced resurrection in his life day by day, we still live in an America which has not yet cashed the check Dr. King brought to Washington in 1963. When it comes to untangling the roots of our nation from white supremacy and creating racial equity, the check continues to be returned, marked insufficient funds. This week, a Minnesota judge and jury began hearing testimony in the murder trial of Minneapolis police officer Derek Chauvin. Once again, we hear the story and watch the video of Officer Chauvin pressing his knee onto the neck of George Floyd for over nine minutes. Nine minutes and 38 seconds while Floyd struggled to say, I can't breathe. Please, please, mama. For many whose eyes were opened by Floyd's death to the systemic depth of racism in our nation. It's not just Chauvin who is on trial this week, but our nation. Do we really believe in liberty and justice for all? As Christians, do we really seek and serve God in all people? and respect the dignity of every human being. It is in the context of our broken world that God challenges us to practice resurrection. Holy Saturday could have been the end of the story, but it wasn't. It wasn't. In our creed, we affirm Jesus descended to the dead and rose again. The question is whether we have the courage and love within us to practice resurrection. The women at the tomb on Easter morning had a hard time overcoming their terror so that they could tell the story. The disciples struggled to overcome their despair at losing Jesus to open their eyes to see him in Galilee. So how do we emerge from our Holy Saturday 
How do we open our eyes, ears, and hearts to the promise and possibility of new life in Christ? How do we practice resurrection? Mark's gospel insists that it is through our stories, through our lives, that the good news is proclaimed. It is in our lives, day by day, that we meet the risen Lord. But how are we expected to live into that hope in the face of our reality? In his book, The Ground Has Shifted, The Future of the Black Church in Post-Racial America, African-American theologian Walter Fluker writes, Hope, as I am using the term, refers to a commitment to the strangeness of the future, a future that is uncertain, fragile, carefully negotiated, and often wrenched, strained, disfigured through suffering. Yet it is situated in the narrow space of transcendence, like the element of surprise in the narrative, the imagined possibility that brings resolution and redemption to the tragic and ironic, only to be upended and returned to the struggle. I'm drawn to Fluker's phrase, a commitment to the strangeness of the future. Because for us, as for the women at the tomb, the world has shifted. We long to return to what was comfortable and familiar. We want God to put a fine feast in front of us and wipe away every tear. But the Easter gospel light shines through the cross. Jesus' crucifixion and resurrection changed everything. It is out of the pain and struggle of the cross that we are called to understand our common humanity and practice resurrection day by day. Poet William Stafford writes, when you wake to the dream of now from night and its other dream, you carry day out of the dark like a flame. Your life you live by the light you find and follow it on as well as you can, carrying through darkness Wherever you go, your one little fire that will start again. Even as worship in the midst of images of our renovated church, we don't know when we will get to sing and pray together in this most amazing space. While we will, listen well, my friends, we will gather for worship here in the church at 525 7th Street at the corner of 7th and Atlantic. We will gather here for worship on Sunday, April 11th at 8 a.m. for a spoken celebration of Holy Eucharist, following all of the many guidelines of the Diocese of Los Angeles and LA County. But we are a long way from gathering as the body of Christ to sing, hug, eat, drink, and be fully together in community in our sacred space. 
That time will come, but not yet, and it will never be the same. More than ever, in the midst of our broken and dying world, we need to practice resurrection. We need to be beacons of light and love. We need to abound in joy. African-American theologian and activist Barbara Holmes writes, Joy unspeakable erupts when you least expect it, when the burden is greatest, when the hope is gone, after bullets fly, it rises on the crest of impossibility. It sways to the rhythm of steadfast hearts and celebrates what we cannot see. May we open ourselves to Easter and go to Galilee trusting that Jesus will meet us there. The resurrection we celebrate today claims victory for us, but it is up to us to live into that victory. It is up to us to practice resurrection in our own lives so that we might transform ourselves, our families, our city, our church, our country, our world. Together, let us finish the story of abundant life. Amen.